Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as we continue our one, especially the former, there is no latter. And when we reflect on the story of what Good Friday and Easter, the resurrection, are all about, we see how close the cross is to the tomb, how close the empty cross is after Jesus was taken down, the cross is empty, how close the cross is to the tomb. And with the good news of the resurrection, it's the empty tomb. And as we, by the grace of God, continue to so journey, and we listen to the scripture readings for this liturgy, we can't help but note the emphasis on teaching and uh, experience. And we find this some early shared with us in the psalm for this liturgy. But also when we hear Moses, as Deuteronomy 4 was read. And not quite so easily when we hear Jesus in that section of the Sermon on the Mount. We see the emphasis on teaching and experience. And as we hear Moses, as the people continue their journey, looking forward to entering the land of promise, there's supposed to be some characteristics of that people which bespeak the reality that they had been called by God. They are God's special people. Their instruction, the law, and the wisdom which is built therein, and as they strive to embody this wisdom, they are to be, as it were, in my own words, something of a light, a light to the nations. But then, as we come to the prophetic ministry of Jeremiah, and we've been hearing a lot of Jeremiah during morning prayer so far this week, we see where Jeremiah becomes not only aware, but he is disturbed as a result of this awareness that Moses is teaching, in a special reference to the law, 
and the giving of the law, which arises out of and is built into and intertwined with the people's experience, beginning with the Exodus, during their journeying through the wilderness, and climaxing in a special way, not anti-climaxing, but climaxing in a special way. Another way will be when they, under Joshua, enter the land of promise. But climaxing with that experience of at the foot of that holy mountain, Moses challenges them to remember their experiences. The miraculous feeding the miraculous drink and the experience at the foot of that mount was so awesome. The people, you remember the story, said to Moses, no, Moses, you speak with the Lord on our behalf. We cannot, we cannot bear we cannot live through the awesomeness of this experience of knowing that the Lord God, our Savior, is so very near, indeed, in our midst. But yet when we come to the prophetic ministry of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is disturbed. He is greatly concerned that notwithstanding all that has been done, especially by the leadership of the nation, to get the people to come back, to return to that initial call of God to be his special people, to be as it were anticipating the servant songs in the prophet Isaiah, book of the prophet Isaiah, and in my own words, to be a light to the nation. Jeremiah arrives at the profound conclusion that something is seriously wrong, yes, but something is radically and fundamentally wrong. And that which he, after a manner of speaking, put his fingers on as to what was so wrong was the fact that this call of God to be the people that God called them and graces them to become, that through their being they might be doing that which is consistent with that divine call, in that, by the grace of God, their doing would reflect the union of their wills with the divine will of Almighty God himself, and thereby be that light to the nation, be that people whom God had redeemed and called for his particular purpose. Jeremiah says, what is wrong is that there was this preoccupation with the outside, this preoccupation with the external, this preoccupation with, in some cases, striving to do, but for some real reason, some human reason after a manner of speaking, they realized in themselves, and Jeremiah in particular realized it, they did not do because they were coming from a position of the outside. Rather than looking at the inner life and striving to move from a position of orientation from within as opposed to from without. And Jeremiah prophesied the new covenant, which we read about in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. 
pulling out one or two strands of it, I will write my law on their inward parts and engrave it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer necessary for anyone to say, know the Lord. And I repeat, this knowing of the Lord is not cerebral. It is not intellectual. It is relational. It will no longer be necessary for anyone to say, what about your relationship with the Lord? Because they will all have this kind of relationship which is concerned not so much with living on the letter from an external perspective, but being and doing within the context of interior orientation and thereby striving, struggling to unite their will with God's will. In other words, it's a relationship of togetherness, of unity, of oneness. It is a oneness which bespeaks character and morality because it speaks true to who and what one is deep down inside. And when we hear the Lord in the Gospel passage for this liturgy, talking about the law and the prophets, one can't help but think that this pericope arises out of the experiences of Matthew and the 12, the other 11, and those who joined uh, that 11 in following the Lord. Their experience of who this man Jesus actually is. It reminds me somewhat of how easy it is to misunderstand. To digress for a moment, it's like what Paul says about what God does in and through the sacrament of holy baptism. We hear Paul speaking to this in Romans 6 and again in Colossians 2 and the opening verses of Colossians 3. And then when we come to the Corinthian community, with particular reference to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, bearing in mind when talking about how easy it is to misunderstand. We hear Paul going all out to remind the Christians at Corinth that although by the grace of God and through the sacrament of holy baptism, we so share the divine life in Christ by virtue of our baptism into the Paschal mystery, that there is a sense in which we have already been raised with Christ and in Christ. And so you find some on the assumption that I am right. You would find some on the misconception that, yes, we have already been raised, There is no further resurrection. And Paul says, there must necessarily be this not yet dimension to our lives as Christians. If that is the case, then Christ himself has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised of all the peoples of the world, we are the most to be pitied. And what is most, what is no less serious is in and through our proclamation we are bearing testimony to a lie. But no, we are being testimony to the truth because Christ has in fact been raised. And that is why there is this not yet dimension 
to the mystery of our lives in Christ as Christians in the world today. And as we read on in the Gospels, especially the first three, and we hear Jesus battling it out against the scribes and the Pharisees, we hear how he is talking about the Sabbath, we hear how he's talking about the ritual rules of purity and so on, where defilement actually comes from. It is quite easy to get the impression, superficially at least, that Jesus had a problem with the law. That Jesus did not have the kind of respect for the law that the scribes and the Pharisees seem to have had. And so we hear him in the opening words of the gospel passage for this liturgy saying, let me tell you something. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The law has a purpose <clears throat> beyond the written word. The law has a purpose which bespeaks that kind of relationship which the law was intended to reflect, namely a relationship of oneness with the God who is Savior and whom the people have experienced along their journey. And the early Christians realize that this fulfillment was in Christ himself. And it's especially when we look at what the fourth evangelist tells us about this Christ. He was in the beginning with God. get into these languages. In other words, he was in this dynamic relationship of total self-orientation towards God. And what he was doing in his earthly ministry was fleshing this relationship out on the stage of history. Again, I repeat, as we hear these readings, let us note, among other things, the emphasis on teaching and experience. And this brings me to two other personalities which I would like to reflect on very briefly at this time. The one is one of the ancient philosophers called Socrates. The other is this Carmelite monk and mystic, the 16th century Teresa of Avila. And those of you who have done philosophy with me, hopefully we will not have forgotten what I shared with you. Unlike those who came before him, who were preoccupied with the outside, trying to make sense of the world. Their preoccupation with cosmology and natural science. Socrates arrived at the profound conclusion and truth that the ABC of making sense of life is not so much the outside, but the inside. What really matters, he says, is the inner life. And he zeroes in on this matter of the soul, not as some kind of mysterious substance imprisoned or housed in our body, but that which he speaks to the seat of the intellect, the core of character which manifests itself 
in the good life. We have heard the principal on a number of occasions sharing with us something of the vision of our founder, Christopher Codrington, and his concern about the soul and the body. No doubt he did classics in his day. No doubt he was very familiar with Socratic philosophy because that's where he's coming from. That's where he is coming from. And Socrates realized that if this is going to characterize civil society, then he has a vitally important part and role to play in getting his students, his pupils, his disciples, as it were, to approach life from the inside as a matter of priority. The first duty of humanity, he says, is to care for this soul. It's a kind of, in his methodology, a kind of what he describes as intellectual midwifery. We know the midwife assists the expectant mother and the deliver her, delivery of her child. He says he, want, he wants to assist his students, his pupils, in giving birth to what that interior life is really all about. That the community as a whole may experience what he describes as the good life. And then we hear St. Teresa of Avila in her vision of the soul, like a diamond pointing in the direction of seven mansions. The first one beginning here and now through prayer and meditation. The seventh is nothing short of unity with Almighty God. It is a journey, a journey of faith. And she finds the sacramental life of the church, the sacramental teaching of the church of inestimable assistance in helping her along this journey. And so, as we continue our journey, as we hear the readings, I would like to call our attention to one or two of the things which we find ourselves doing here on a regular basis. Not only between Sunday and Saturday, but especially Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday because Wednesday and Friday we go straight into the liturgy. And there is nothing at all wrong with that. Thank God for that. The liturgy is still central to our lives as it ought to be. But you will recall, you will notice that between the ending of morning prayer and the beginning of the Eucharist, there is a period of silence. which I would like to believe we, is intended for us to look at the inner life, to look internally as we journey, to reflect on morning prayer and the readings for morning prayer as we look forward to celebrating the Holy Eucharist. Some 10 minutes or so in between the two experiences, what do we make of this space? What do we make of this time? The scriptures remind us of the importance of teaching and experience. With a view to dealing with the inner life, the inner castle 
as St. Teresa of Avila would describe it. 16th century Spanish Carmelite nun and mystic. Castillo Interior, the inner castle. And she journeyed. And we find ourselves journeying every morning, at least between Sunday and Saturday, in a sacred space such as this. A journey which climaxes within the context of the celebration of the Holy Eucharist with our participation in the precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ which speaks to, as we are reminded, every time we pray the prayer of humble access, both in its full, enlarged form, which we are doing during this season of Lent, and in its contracted form, which we find ourselves doing other times during the course of the year in celebration of the Holy Eucharist. And with reference to its full form, we pray, grant Lord of grace and love that we may so eat the flesh of your dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and drink his blood that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. This mutual indwelling, which is where I believe God wills us to be, that by the grace of God, we might, only, might not only be consistent with his will, but do all that is consistent with his will. There are good habits and there are bad habits. But if it's going to be a habit especially coming here every morning, sharing in morning prayer, sharing in the Eucharist, making our communion. Let it be a good habit, but not a thoughtless habit. We are human beings made in the image and likeness of God. And let us call to mind what this is all about. And what a marvelous opportunity we have being here in this place. The whole atmosphere is conducive to what we are doing here. And be concerned that as we journey, we will grow. And as we grow, we will be not only formed, but transformed so that when the time comes for us to leave this place, and if, God willing, we should be ordained, we would take this kind of spirituality with us and encourage those whom we are privileged to serve to join us in this journey. whether you want to take a philosophical approach or whether you want to take the approach of Teresa of Avila and the mystical approach. I would suggest that it be a both and, but if you have to choose, choose the latter, the latter. And let us realize that God is not calling us to be preoccupied with the outside. The outside is just part of our existential reality. But if we're going to make sense of the outside, then we need to understand. We need to know, and thereby and therefore understand what the inner life, what the interior castle, to quote St. Teresa of Avila 
what this seven-story mansion is all about in terms of our spiritual journey, journey, our faith journey, which leads us ultimately into that relationship for which God has made us all in the first place. Union with God. Unity in God. May that God for granted. Amen. We believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary and became a man. Third day he rose again, fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended in heaven and was seated at the right hand of the he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will come. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the first life, who proceeds from the Father. The Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Intercession, Form A. Each petition ends with, Father in heaven, and your response is, hear our humble prayer. We pray for all our bishops, priests, and deacons and all others who serve in leadership positions within the church. May their lives be an example of godly discipline and may they continue to lead your people in truth. Father in heaven, hear our prayer. We bring before you all who have lapsed, lost faith, or are caught up in earthly treasures. Give them the desire to seek you and those things which are of heavenly value. Father in heaven, hear our prayer. We pray for all places of learning for this college, especially remembering the college board and trust as they prepare to go into meeting tomorrow. May their deliberation and decisions be fruitful and according to your will. We pray also for all its students that God will continue to bless us during this time of discernment. Father in heaven, Hear our prayer. As we continue this Lenten season, we ask that you continue to bless us. Help us to remember that it is a season of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. We pray for those who lack the daily necessities and ask that you provide for them. Father in heaven, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world that God will grant peace and unity among them. We pray for all heads of state and ask that God will continue, to, that they will continue to lead with dignity and to make decisions that's beneficial for all. We continue to pray for all who are affected by man-made or natural disasters 
especially remembering the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines who continue to face the threat of volcanic eruption. Father in heaven, hear our humble prayer. As we continue to battle with COVID-19, dengue virus, dengue fever, cancer, and all other disease, we ask for God's protection over our lives. We pray for healing for those who are affected and ask that God will grant them a speedy recovery. For those who have died, we ask that God will grant them eternal rest. Father in heaven, hear our humble prayer. And finally, we pray for ourselves, asking for guidance, protection, and wisdom. And as we prepare to receive the Holy Sacrament, we pray for grace to receive it in good conscience and in holiness of life. Father in heaven, hear our humble prayer. Hear these our prayers, Almighty God, and grant that what we ask, you may grant unto us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore confess our sins. Almighty God, our heavenly, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not loved ourselves as we are. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are the body of Christ. By the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body and have all been made to drink of the one spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Through your goodness, Lord, we have this bread and wine to offer, the fruit of the earth and the work of human hands. All things come from you, Lord, and all will be yours. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Father Almighty, everlasting God. For you bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, all creation rightly gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom you sent to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. We therefore bring you these gifts, and we ask you to make them holy by the power of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered himself in obedience to your will, the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Christ until he comes again. Father, calling to mind the death your Son endured for our salvation, his glorious resurrection and ascension, his continual intercession for us in heaven, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and life-giving sacrifice. Look with favor on the church's offering and grant that we who eat and drink these holy gifts may be filled with your Holy Spirit and become one body in Christ and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. May he make us a perpetual offering to you and enable us in communion with Blessed Mary and the whole company of heaven to share in the inheritance of your saints with him and in him and through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father Almighty, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ with faith and thanksgiving. Do not presume to come to this your table, most merciful Father, trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your boundless mercy. We are not even worthy to gather of the crumbs under your table, but you are the Lord, ever the same, ever merciful. Grant, therefore, Lord of grace and love, that we may so eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and drink his blood, that with bodies and souls made clean from every stain of sin, we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you and all persons in you with gladness and singleness of heart through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, to take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. The Lord be with you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. So good.